For years, I've asked my students what routing protocol they use on their corporate networks. And overwhelmingly, the response has been OSPF, Open Shortest Path First. OSPF is one of our link state routing protocols, and a link state routing protocol has a map of the network. It knows how each of the routers within an area of the network are interconnected. Unlike EIGRP that knows here's the next hop to get to the destination, EIGRP doesn't know how the routers are interconnected, but OSPF does. And OSPF is one link state routing protocol you might run into out in the world, but another link state routing protocol that I want you to be aware of, not covered in this video, and that's intermediate system to intermediate system. So we've got OSPF and ISIS. And as a metaphor, I want you to think of OSPF much like working a puzzle. If you and your friends are sitting around a table working a puzzle, you have puzzle pieces, they have puzzle pieces, you each have portions of the overall picture that you're trying to put together. That's much the way that OSPF works. Different routers are connected to different networks within this area, and they can share their information, or metaphorically, their puzzle pieces with one another, and after they all exchange their information, they should have the same view of the network. And here are a few characteristics I'd like you to know about OSPF. It is an open standard, so it's not vendor proprietary, and routers that are exchanging their puzzle pieces, their information with one another, they have formed adjacencies. And we can also form neighborships with OSPF, and there's a difference between an adjacency and a neighborship. I'll distinguish between those two in just a moment. But we said these different routers know different pieces of information, and they're going to collaborate together to put together this map of the network. Well, that information is in the form of LSAs, link state advertisements. Those are sent between the routers to educate one another about what networks are available and how things are interconnected. And then within each router, those LSAs are grouped together. We put the puzzle pieces together to form the map of the network. And that map is referred to as the link state database. And once we've got that database in place, and we know how everything is interconnected, we know the bandwidth on each of the links between the routers, we can run the Dijkstra shortest path first algorithm, and it's going to determine the optimum path between any one point in the network and any other point in the network. By the way, that is exactly how your car's navigation system works. It also uses the Dijkstra algorithm to determine the shortest path. Or maybe you've got a navigation program on your smartphone, and your smartphone might do a recalculation. If there's some sort of an accident on the road, it might detect that, and suddenly it assigns a higher cost to that roadway, and it can divert you around that. Well, OSPF, if we have an issue in the network, we can reroute around that issue if we do have a backup path. And once OSPF has built its link state database and it knows what it considers to be the best route to get to a specific network, that route becomes a candidate to be injected into the router's IP routing table. But here's a big point. Just because OSPF has a route to a network, it does not mean that that OSPF learned route will necessarily be placed into the IP routing table because we may have a route information source that still advertises that network that's more believable than OSPF. Maybe EIGRP is advertising the very same network. If that's the case, then our router is going to believe EIGRP over OSPF because EIGRP is more believable. It has a lower administrative distance of 90 as compared to OSPF's administrative distance of 110. And before we take a look at how things interconnect in an OSPF network, I want you to understand these terms. The first is a hello message. This is how those neighborships are formed. And we're going to be talking about something in a few moments called a designated router. A hello message is also how we're going to elect a designated router. And we said that the information that's exchanged between our routers, that information is an LSA, a link state advertisement. In our analogy, an LSA is much like a puzzle piece. However, here's a big misconception. A lot of times people will say this router sent an LSA packet. Actually, that's not technically correct. LSAs are information. They're not packet types. An LSU, a link state update, that's a type of packet that carries the LSA. So the packet is an LSU. The information inside of that LSU, that's the LSA. 
And have you ever been working a puzzle and it seems like you're missing a piece, you're trying to work in this corner and you ask your friends around the table, hey, does anybody have a piece that looks like this? I'm looking for a straight edge. You're requesting a missing piece to the puzzle. You want to see if anybody else has it. That's what a router can do. If a router has attempted to construct its link state database, but it's missing a piece, it can request from other routers that missing piece of information, or in other words, that missing LSA. That's an LSR, a link state request. And if a neighbor gives it that missing piece of information, it will say thank you in the form of a link state acknowledgement, an LSAC. Now I mentioned there was a difference between a neighborship and an adjacency. Let's discuss that. First of all, a neighbor is with a router on our same network segment. We share the same subnet. And we're going to exchange hello messages using multicast. We don't broadcast it like RIP version 1 did. We send a multicast hello to the multicast address of 224.0.0.5. That's with IP version 4. For your notes, for IP version 6, it's FF02 colon colon 5. But this is what a neighbor it is. We've said hello to one another, but we've not exchanged information. That's what an adjacency will do. And when I think about this, I think about my two neighbors. Where I live, there are only two neighbors anywhere near our house. Now, one neighbor I know pretty well. We've worked on some projects together. We've been to one another's homes. We've got a much tighter relationship. We exchange information. The other neighbor, I really don't know them very well. I know the car they drive, so I'll wave at them as I'm leaving my driveway and we'll say hello to one another. But that's really it. We don't have a very deep relationship. We just say hello. We're just neighbors in this scenario. My other neighbor that I do know better, that's much like an adjacency. Not only do we say hello, we say hello, but in addition to that, we exchange information. That's what an adjacency does. Routers that are OSPF adjacent, they are neighbors. That's a prerequisite. But in addition to just saying hello, they have exchanged information to build that link state database. And you might be wondering, it sounds like an adjacency is better. Why would we ever have just a neighbor when we could have everybody be adjacent with one another? Well, it's not going to scale terribly well. If we have, for example, an Ethernet segment, and this segment has multiple OSPF speaking routers on it, if everybody was adjacent with everybody else, that could be a lot of adjacencies. Consider this. We've got six routers in this example. If every router were adjacent to every other router, that would be, let's do the math. Here's the formula. It's n times n minus 1 divided by 2. So n, that's the number of routers. That's 6. n minus 1 is 5. So 6 times 5 is 30 divided by 2 is 15. We would have to have 15 adjacencies to fully mesh these routers together. And that's with just 6 routers. Imagine if we had 10 routers. That would be 10 times 9 divided by 2. That's 45 adjacencies. So what we can do instead on networks like this, they're called OSPF broadcast networks because they all belong to the same broadcast domain, we can have designated routers. We can elect a router as a DR or a BDR, a backup designated router, in case the designated router is not available. And here's the trick. Once we elect designated and backup designated routers, the other routers in this network, they don't need to form adjacencies with one another. They just need to form adjacencies with the DR and the BDR. That dramatically reduces the number of adjacencies that we have to have. And I mentioned the multicast address that was used for routers to say hello to one another with OSPF. Here's a reminder of those IPv4 and IPv6 addresses. But if we're just wanting to communicate route updates with DRs and BDRs, it's a different multicast address. For IP version 4, it's 224.0.0.6. And for IP version 6, it's FF02 colon colon 6. That goes to all designated routers, which includes the backup designated router. Now, at this point, we've talked about how OSPF routers share a common view of the network. They share a map. Well, technically, that map covers an OSPF area. Some networks only have one OSPF area, but you can divide up an OSPF area into multiple areas. That's what we have here. We've got area 0 at the bottom, and we've got area 1 and area 2. And notice I've got a calculator next to each one. What I'm saying there is that the calculation, in other words, the Dijkstra algorithm, is performed on each area. 
That way, if we have a really big area, that Dijkstra algorithm calculation doesn't take more processor resources. And you might wonder how a network known to Area 0 gets advertised over to Area 1. Well, that's the job of an ABR, an area border router. An ABR sits at the border of at least two areas. And it can send information back and forth between those areas. Not an entire map. R3 is not telling Area 1, hey, here's a map of Area 0. It's just saying, here is a list of networks available in Area 0. You don't have to run the Dijkstra algorithm on it. But if you want to get to any of those networks, come to me. I'll get you there. That's the job of an ABR. And notice that I've got an Area 0. That's actually a requirement. If you have more than one area in your OSPF network, you've got to have what is called a backbone area. And that backbone area is going to be numbered 0. Or your areas can actually be numbered to look like IPv4 addresses. That backbone area could be named 0.0.0.0. .0 now, even though that looks like an IPv4 address, it's really not. We're not saying, here's how to get to this network. Or we might have Area 1's area number as 1.1.1.1. We're not saying we can get to that IP address. That's simply the name of the area. You can write it either as just a decimal number, like 0, or a dotted decimal, like 0.0.0.0. .0 .0 .0. I typically just use the decimal approach. And you might wonder from a design perspective, when do we need to start adding areas? How big is too big? Well, a lot of people are too cautious about this, in my opinion. There was a recommendation that uh, Cisco made many years ago, and that was if you have more than 50 routers in an area, in order to not overburden those router processors when they're running the Dijkstra algorithm, you might want to break that up into other areas. However, that recommendation was based on a very, very old Cisco router. If you're familiar with Cisco, it's a 2500 series router, which is slow. These days, the router speeds and processor capabilities are orders of magnitude faster than those old routers. So it's not that big of an issue now. Personally, I would not start breaking off my area into multiple areas just because I had maybe a couple of hundred routers in an area. Now, I may break off an area that happened to represent, let's say, a data center. It might help me to do troubleshooting to have all of the data center routes in one link state database and my enterprise routes in a different link state database. So I might do that. And as one final consideration with OSPF, let's think about how OSPF judges the best path. With RIP, we used the fewest number of router hops. That's not the case with OSPF. Consider this topology. We want PC1 to communicate with PC2. And it has two ways of getting there. It could go to R1, up to R2, down to R3, and then out to PC2. Or it could go to R1 and go directly over to R3. If we were running RIP, R1 would say, oh, I can get to PC2 with one router hop if I go through R3. I don't want to go through two router hops. I'm certainly not going to go to R2 and then to R3. I'll just do it in one router hop. However, notice the link speeds. That link between R1 and R3, it's running at a measly 10 megabits per second. The link speeds between R1 and R2, and also R2 and R3, those are 100 megabit per second links. So those are going to be faster. Now we can look at that and say, well, obviously I want to go over the 100 meg links. I don't want to go over that 10 meg link. That's not the way RIP would look at it though. Here's how OSPF does that calculation. It makes its decision based on the cost of a link. The cost is a function of that link speed. We have something called the reference bandwidth and we divide it by the interface's bandwidth, and that gives us a cost value. Now, on Cisco routers, the default reference bandwidth is 100 megabits per second. So let's do some math. What would be the cost of that bottom link between R1 and R3? Well, it would be 100 meg, our reference bandwidth, divided by 10 meg, the link speed. 100 divided by 10, that's 10. We've got a cost of 10 going from R1 to R3. What about those 100 meg links? Well, that's going to be the reference bandwidth of 100 meg divided by the link speed of 100 meg for cost of 1. So the cost is 1 between R1 and R2, between R2 and R3. And as we exit R3 to go down to PC2, that's another cost of 1 because that's another 100 meg link. So let's do some comparison. If I went from R1 to R2 to R3, what would be my cost? Well, it would be 1 plus 1 plus 1. It's a cost of 1 to get from R1 to R2 another cost of 1 to get from R2 to R3, and another cost of 1 to get from R3 out to PC2. A total of 3. 
What if I took that fewer hop path that RIP would select? If I went directly from R1 to R3, then it would be a cost of 10 just to get over to R3, and then it would be a cost of 1 to get out of R3 going down to PC2. 10 plus 1, that's 11. So looking at this, clearly the best path for PC1 to use to get to PC2 is to go from R1 to R2 to R3 and then out to PC2. And that's a look at the theory of open shortest path first, the OSPF routing protocol. Mm -hmm.